Aloha, and welcome to this bi-weekly show, The State of the State of Hawaii. Um, yeah, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and today our topic is about uh, Hawaii's midterm election results. So we are interested to address what, what did the midterm vote do and tell us about Hawaii now, what what do voters say to us uh, in, in the voting outcomes that we have? So to talk about some of these questions and others, um, uh, we have an expert guest, and that person is Dr. Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, the director of the center, the policy center. And um, he is here to help us understand what what we have to understand now about the uh, the outcomes. So we know that we have the new executive uh, leadership team in place and we have um, the rest uh, and we have also the other uh, roles of government uh, newly fulfilled. And, uh, and also we have some other aspects of the election to discuss like the turnout. And I think that's one of the first que questions I'd like to bring up with our guest, uh, Dr. Colin Moore, is uh, our our voter turnout this year for this election plummeted uh, from uh, er earlier elections, uh, and and on the at about the time of the voting, the um, the the rate of voters was forty one percent. I think now they're uh, coming up with a number like forty eight percent voting uh, percentage, but. Um, it's still less than 50% of the voters who were sent all of the ballots that Hawaii sends out to make voting easy. So the state has gone to some effort to make voting a little easier, but now we have this very, very low voting turnout rate. So Colin, could you talk to us a little bit about that and what it means? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me on, Stephanie. Um, right, so turnout was low. And I think a lot of people have described this as one of the quietest general election seasons here in Hawaii that they can remember. I mean, there was a, a lot of activity on the mainland, a lot of money spent, but here very little. Um, you know, there are very few signs. There was relatively little spending from the campaigns. Um, and I think there were people who forgot that there really, really was much of a midterm here, um, in part because the top of the ticket races, governor, senator, uh, U.S. House, a lot of those people reasonably thought were more or less locked up already. The Green, Shots, Takuda case were going to win very easily. So you, you mentioned voter turnout, and I want to unpack this a little bit because this is a more complicated question than people, I think, fully appreciate. So the final voter turnout we got in 2022 was about 48 percent, which meant that of the registered voters, 48% of those turned out to vote. But I wanna be a little careful when I describe this. So overall, um, you know, nationwide uh, turnout, th there's a few ways that this is measured. And sometimes it's measured in a different way um, called the voting eligible population, um, which means that the total number of people who basically are US citizens over 18, how many of those turned out to vote? Um, that number nationwide is somewhere around 46%, and Hawaii actually is more like 40%. Um, so there are states that had lower voter turnouts than us in the last election, places like West Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi. So we're not the worst. So that might be one piece of good news. The second thing I'd say is that um, for the way we measure voter turnout, ourselves, we have to be a little bit careful because the number of registered voters since over the last few years, particularly since we've moved to automatic voter registration, has gone through the roof. And when that, when that happens, it means that, you know, um, we could have the same number of people voting or even a little more, but as a percentage of total turnout, it's going to look like it goes down. So we actually had more people vote in 2022 than 2018. Um, although the voter turnout didn't really look any better. The last thing I'd say about this, which is you know, my last point of caution about voter turnout here, is that there were only about 726,000 ballots that were mailed out. Um, you know, the number of registered voters is way higher than that. So if you look at just the number, the percentage of people who returned a ballot or participated, 
um, as a percentage of the number of votes that were mailed out, we're looking at more like 57% participation. So it looks a little bit better. Um, our election office is very careful about purging registered voters. You have to receive a notice a couple of times, but there's you know quite a number of people who end up in this sort of purgatory where they're not mailed a ballot, but they're still kept on the list of registered voters. Um, and it takes a while for them to get to taken off the list. So that's a long way of saying, I don't think people should be freaking out about our voter turnout rate. It's it's not great, but it's not perhaps as terrible as it sometimes appears. Well, that that is interesting. So can you say make that clear now about the the group that's in purgatory? Who's getting who's in that overlap or underlap? So so they're likely people who so, so there are people where the elections office can't confirm that they still live where they are, where they say they are, because they haven't participated in an election. Um, they haven't responded to one of their notices trying to confirm that they still are uh, registered at that address. So they're not removed from the list of registered voters, but they're no, they are no longer mailed a ballot. Um, and and it's quite a number of people who are in that category. Um, you know. Hawaii sometimes has a pretty transient population um, or people, you know, move to a different location and don't re-register. I want to be clear, this has nothing to do with voter fraud. We're not mm -hmm. we're not talking about people who are, you know, perhaps registered who shouldn't be registered or participating in ways they shouldn't be participating. This is just because the elections office is very careful that they only mail ballots to people who they're sure live at those addresses because they've participated in past elections or they've responded to one of these inquiries. But they're also very careful not to remove people from the list of registered voters. And so there's a group who are still registered voters who don't get a ballot. This is just a really, this is a complex process, but this is a way of explaining why we have so many registered voters, but we only mail out we mail out many fewer ballots than uh, a num the number of registered voters actually reflect. Well, that's very interesting. I found that I was in a, a pinch because I was not here uh, for a while before the election, and I had uh, had my mail also forwarded mm -hmm. uh, to that other place. Now, so I was not expecting to get my ballot in my forwarded mail. So um, because I had read that it was against the law or that Hawaii did not forward ballots. So um, I never expected to receive a ballot. And then when I at the very end, before I left to come back, then I went and picked up my mail and I had a ballot. There was my ballot. And um, but there wasn't enough time to mm, fill it out right. and mail it back, right? So I was in that situation. So fortunately, I was able to, I was coming back in time to be able to go to Honolulu and Holly and, and vote there in line and took my ballot with me and said that I had it. Other people seemed to have other situations too where they were bringing their ballots, but nobody seemed to care that uh, about the question of why did it get sent to me when I, I understood it wasn't what Hawaii did, that we don't forward these out of state. So nobody really wanted to take me up on that. And I said, well, I wasn't, I was just curious to know because it did set me up with a situation of possibly missing the mm -hmm. chance to vote. Um, so um, I also, um, so I also found out, and, and I don't know how rare that situation is, or and I don't know if I'm correct about Hawaii doesn't mail out ballots out of state but then how would they do that because actually one person who did respond to me said that it was the federal uh, mail processing that caused the ballot to be moved out of state to be mailed out of state it didn't have to do with hawaii so maybe they don't have a way to intervene on the ballot forwarding although it's in an orange envelope and it should be identifiable and if it is in the law it ought to be precluded from going out. And is this an issue or not an issue for anybody? I think I think in this particular issue, you're talking about something that affects a very small number of people. I mean, people who would have had a mail forwarding service at the time the ballots were mailed out. And I doubt the U.S. Postal Service knows what to what to remove from that pile and, and what not to. Um, and uh, I mean, that would probably be a, a good question for the elections office. My, my guess is they don't 
mail ballots out of state. In other words, they don't, um, you know, if you, you, you couldn't register um, and have your official address not be in Hawaii. Um, but maybe, yeah, I mean, you ask an interesting question. I, I would assume you can still get a, um, an out of state ballot if you register for it that way, um, okay. that would be mailed out of state. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's something to be too worried about because I think there are very, very few people in, in that situation. Yeah. So, um, okay, I, I, I'm going to not worry about it at all <laughs> unless I come across some information that has uh, says that it's the law to not send them out of state. And then I might be interested to, to look into it a little bit more. But anyway, um, it was a, a little bit disconcerting. Um, and then when I came back and found out that the voter turnout was so low, that's when it rose to a little higher level for me because I thought how many are caught up in this. But anyway, we're already so overwhelmed with the, the fraudulent cries and this sort of thing that um, this is a um, that's certainly explainable by having the confusion over who how how do they get a mail forwarded ballot out of the mail forwarded of the U.S. Post Office and get that under control is a whole nother story. So we don't want to stay on that topic much longer. But I think you're saying that races. Some of the comments that I've read about the low turnout is that the races so many times are already already decided in the in the primary in the state that the incentive to vote has been low and that that's a factor of it. Do you agree with that? I do. I mean, there's a couple of things going on there. Um, so you're right that there is very little competition sometimes in our general election. Um, and to the extent there is, it's often with nonpartisan races like the mayor's race. And we saw that a little bit in Maui where they had a competitive mayor's race. Um, and that excitement leads people to vote, but it also means there's likely to be a lot more spending and communication around the election. I mean, those election advertisements, ads, those get people, those inform people that there's an election going on and get them interested in it. Um, and we didn't really have any of that. So there's no other than public service announcements. There's no there's not that level of communication that's going on in a really competitive election that's obviously funded by the campaigns themselves. Um, so I, I do think that's primarily the reason. If you look at Hawaii's turnout for primary elections, we actually have pretty relatively high turnout for primary elections compared to a lot of states uh, because that's where the action is. That's where all the competition is. That's where the communication is. But when we move to general elections, that's where our turnout really suffers. Um, and partly it's, it's rational. Uh, people don't really feel like their vote matters much because most of these uh, races aren't all that competitive. Um, I will say that there were some some unexpected results this time. Uh, the Republican Party in Hawaii, which often struggles, um, had a little bit better of an outcome. It was a pretty good year by Hawaii standards for Republicans. They managed to pick up two seats in the House. They picked up one in the Senate. Um, you know, and that was due to, I think, turnout and excitement around those really local races, mainly in central and west Oahu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, that that's true. I wanted to ask you about the Republican activity, which did seem to have a, a, a larger presence in this in this election. And do you think that that um, that vote was constrained to more local elections because of the the, the national issues were um, un, unappealing to um, to Hawaii's voters? I mean, do we have people here that don't tend to the national? Come, I think that for. For Republicans here, they tend to do best when they are talking about very local issues. Um, and, and often you will see Republicans, I think successful Republicans, try not to try not to get bogged down by a bunch of national level ideological issues. Um, you even saw that with Duke Iona's campaign. I mean, I don't think he ran a very successful campaign, but he basically tried to sidestep questions about abortion, about Trump. Um, about about other issues and to say those are more or less it's either irrelevant or those are settled issues in Hawaii law. Um, and that was an approach used by some of the other Republican candidates. Uh, they're most successful when they do try to set themselves up as an alternative to the Hawaii Democratic Party. In fact, I think a lot of Republicans, or, or at least some that I've seen um, have success, people like Kurt Favela, the senator from Eva Beach, now the uh, now one of two Republican senators 
really tend to uh, engage in local issues, kind of anti-corruption issues, issues of transparency, places where Republicans have been really strong and not try to not try to become representatives of the more Trump MAGA brand from the mainland um, that isn't too successful out here. Uh, I mean, people don't love the Hawaii Democratic Party, but there aren't too many ideological conservatives, not a lot to win, certainly statewide elections, but even in most legislative districts. But there is a lot of frustration with the Hawaii Democratic Party. So if you can just set yourself up as an alternative, uh, that uh, that can be pretty successful as long as you don't get dragged into these ideological debates. Is uh, yeah, that that seems uh, reasonable um, and, and informative uh, uh, a way to describe it. it. It would be good to have a little more competition and varying um, uh, viewpoints expressed in the in the campaign. Of course, if we had more presence uh, uh, from the Republicans, but may, maybe this this year is. Uh, uh, beginning of um, an increase in in that participation, hopefully. Now, getting back to, of course, this um, the low turner uh, uh, turnout and these other factors of our situation in Hawaii. Um, are you a proponent of the ranked choice voting hmm. approach? Does that make a difference for the ways Hawaii is short in in successful voting outcomes? Yeah, rank the rank choice is interesting because it's one of these things that has finally got a lot of attention after pretty much being off the radar in, in the United States for decades. Um, and it's expanded a little bit. They now have ranked choice systems in Maine and most famously now in Alaska. Um, so would something like that be adopted here? I mean, I think the short answer to that question is is no, because mostly this has come through an initiative and proposition system directly from voters. Um, we don't have that in Hawaii. And so I think it's very unlikely that the state legislature would move to a system like that, because for the most part, elected representatives don't like to do anything that upsets the system you know, under which they were elected. Um, now, would ranked choice help? So there's a few ways you can think about this. Um, so the, the way ranked choice is done in Alaska, where you rank, you know, like the name suggests, one, two, three, and then if your first choice uh, comes in for, for, in this case, third, then those votes are redistributed. So you're never wasting votes. Um, some people say that this creates more, um, you know, moderate candidates. It certainly would create more competitive elections. I think ranked choice is a fine system. I think that multi-member districts are another way to get at that, which we used to have in Hawaii, um, which seems to lead to more competition, more certainly diversity in, in the candidates you get. Another way to do that is to move to a California style top two system where no matter what the party is, the top two vote getters advance to the next round. So in Hawaii it would often be two Democrats advancing to the next round, but voters would still get another look at those candidates in the general election. I think all of those systems are fine. I don't think any of them would really solve the, the central problem here, which is more competition. What I would like to see is a more robust system of public financing here, and there's a lot of good options to choose from. If I had to pick, I'd rather have better public financing versus rank choice or something like that. The last problem with rank choice that I'll mention is a lot of voters just find it very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's never good. Um, because voters already find parts of the electoral system confusing and, and intimidating, and ranked choice might just add another level of unnecessary complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you've got a good point there, but uh, there could be put put some effort into getting uh, that information out uh, would 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 help a lot. Um, well, okay, on the public financing of a, a change to a, a one of these other uh, uh, ways to vote. Where where would that public financing come from? Are you expecting that to be something that taxpayers would be willing to back, or would there would would that be something in a candidate, the candidates or the executives, the government, the governor? Would would he do anything like that? Where would that come? How would that get moving? Good good question. So Hawaii actually was an early leader in public financing. We've had a system of public financing since 1978, and. Uh, that that money comes from a uh, check off on your income tax returns, uh, which fewer and fewer people are opting in. But it, it is enough that it, there is a fund available, a public finance fund. Um, it doesn't offer a whole lot of money and fewer and fewer candidates have been taking advantage of it. 
I think in this last election cycle, Kai Kahele famously said he was going to use public financing to run his campaign, and then he didn't file a required affidavit and, and became ineligible for that financing. But our system doesn't provide enough money to make it worthwhile for most candidates to opt in, because to get that money, you have to agree to an expenditure limit. And the limit's too low, the money isn't enough. But there are better ways to do it. And um, there's really three ways, uh, three places I think are doing it better than us. The first way is what they now do in Maine and Arizona, which is just full public financing. If you can show that you have enough voter support, uh, then the state will provide a grant um, that is, they decide how much, there's a formula uh, that determines how much money that is, but it's pretty generous. Um, there in New York City, there is a, what they call a super match program. So if you, for example, raise $100, the city will match that donation up to $800. Um, and then the last way is what they have in Seattle, which I think is the most innovative system, where they actually send vouchers to voters. So every voter gets four $25 vouchers, um, and then they can distribute those vouchers to the candidates of their choice. But the money comes from a public fund, not from voters. Um, so it democratizes campaign finance. So where does the government get this money? Well, in Hawaii, it gets it from income taxes. In Seattle, it gets it from a levy on uh, property taxes. The truth is mainly that we're not talking about a whole lot of money here. We're talking about uh, well, it depends on how many people opt in, but a few million dollars usually is is what would do it. Um, so my position always has been that for tax dollars, this is a relatively small amount of money that could really increase political competition. And I think get better quality candidates because a lot of people who would be good candidates, one of the reasons they don't want to run is because they don't want to have to raise a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a huge impediment to the whole operation. I, I, so, well, I what about the people who uh, are, are the the non winners of of uh, of uh, for instance with the governor? We have many many nice candidates, many appealing candidates for governor, and then uh, and I think that um, I was getting confused for a while because uh, that forty one percent or forty eight percent or less than fifty percent coming in and voting doesn't represent a, a, a big a big. Um, lunge of support for that candidate that was selected out of the competition that we do have during the campaign. So it seems like um, for those who don't win, who don't get traction early and have that that income to do the campaign, it, it, it sets up kind of an unfair situation. I don't know. Is there anything to that? that that makes um, sense to yeah, I mean, look, we know in Hawaii who, who are voters and who are not voters. I mean, voters tend to be older, wealthier, better educated. We know that people in, in East Oahu vote at much higher rates than people in West Oahu or South Maui. Um, and so the electorate looks different than the population at large, It, um, you know, and they care about different issues. So I always tell people like my students, because young people don't vote either, if you want candidates to care about your issues, uh, then as a group, you need to start voting more. I mean, why do older people get so much attention? Why do public sector workers get so much attention? Because they're reliable voters. Um, and so you do, it is skewed. And, and as a result of that, the issues that policymakers care about um, is skewed as well. Well, that's a very good point. And I understand that there were some young people groups that did uh, play in this past election didn't didn't um, are they calling them the is it the Gen Xers that some some did show up I mean which, which group are the gun control youngsters and the ones that have gone through these high school and grade school gun shooting incidents do you happen to know about their their success in this last election or their um, presence so so I think that there are some really motivated young people who have turned out and they've been really good at drawing attention to some of those issues. Certainly gun control has been one, the, the young millennials, Gen Z folks, um, but they're not turning out en masse in a group. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, we'd like to see a lot more of that. Um, you know, that's the way you, you can gain political power. And it's, particularly true here in Hawaii, uh, where we have real fall off um, from older voters to younger voters. We tend to have some of the lowest rates of 
young voter turnout um, in the state here. And I don't think we've seen the kind of mobilization among some groups that you've seen on the mainland for young voters. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some education that has to happen here too. Hasn't civics completely fallen out of the curriculum? Are we doing any of that? In our we, we, we are doing we are doing some. I mean, I've been involved in some of this at the state level, but we don't have a lot of emphasis on civics. There's only a one semester of required civics in high school. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of support for that at the Department of Education. I mean, the folks I know who work in social studies are terrific and work very hard to try to encourage civic education, but they don't get the kind of resources they need, and, and there needs to be more curricular support for that. I think that's true across the nation, but it's also true here, and I think that's one place we can really make an intervention. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that that one civics course, uh, just a semester course in high school, is still required. But like you said, it, it, it could be replaced easily with these other emphases that we've had over the last uh, several years. Um, so that then that leaves it to you, Colin, and your colleagues. They have to come to your department to get into these issues and to see how important it is that they know about them. Well, when you have gone out and done things in the school, what have you done and what's happened as a result of that? Uh, you've been invited by individual schools or did the education department ask you to say something? We, I mean, I've worked on various initiatives with the DOE, and I, I actually helped revise the, the civic standards for the state that were rolled out um, a couple of years ago. Um, and and the, what we tried to do when we did these revisions, just in the last few minutes we have, is to make it more about active civics, um, to get students actively involved in trying to change policy, to understand how this works on the ground level, and to, to make civics a little bit less about reading the Constitution and reading the great ideas of, you know, the 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 old dead white men who wrote this stuff, which, of course, is extremely important. And they had very valuable ideas and need to be understood. But we don't think that's the way into civics. The way into civics is through action. And then through that, you can understand why the structure is the way it is, you know, understand these ideas. But we, we were trying to make this in civics as uh, uh, as something students could be involved in in change and not just um, as participants. Well, that is a breakthrough, I believe, to see action as your entry point, because when you mentioned about the Locke and Hobbes and all of the people that influenced our founding fathers and those philosophers that were so important to having even a notion of uh, de democracy, a uh, uh, de democratic republic. Um, so that kind of turns that around. That's very good, Colin. I'm excited about that. Me That's too. <laughs> So you got to keep on with that. We need to hear maybe more about that if you're going to be involved in it, because we're so, uh, sorely losing here. And especially I did go to one gun rally in Washington, D.C., at which the um, Mr. Hogg, the young man who was in the the, mm -hmm. the gun shooting in Florida and uh, very, very impressive young people who are speaking to this issue and, and exciting group, you know, large, large crowds of groups to, to their side of things. But they don't seem to be able to dig in and make any difference at the at the national level to get some legislation. Going. But they're not finished yet. Right. And they're still young and energetic. But um, this is a very, very important. So I'm glad this came up. It's really interesting to think about. And I would uh, maybe that's something to watch for. Let's see if uh, we get some some publicity on that. But what do you see coming up for the next the next round? The next round, everybody's going to get elected again, right? So the next time we have an election, it'll just be everybody up for re-election. But how do you see us going forward here with our um, voting um, in Hawaii? Will it stay the same? Or do you think we've got some um, some incentives coming from other from other places that it's going to make it different? Um We'll have a presidential election next time, so voting always goes up during a presidential election. Uh, but I don't see any anything on the horizon where we're going to see dramatic increases in in voter turnout here or or participation. Um, I wish I could I wish I could say something different, but uh, this stuff changes slowly. So um, there there is no silver bullet. This is what I said when we rolled out mail in votes that. It's not going to solve the problem immediately, and, and it didn't, but I think civic education could really help.
Okay, great. Yes, yes. I think that's such a good point to end on. Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and and kind of go back over what we've just been through. It was a very special time and Hawaii uh, did its duty. And uh, I just was informed that I said Jen X, I think when I meant to say Gen Z, so I wanted to just correct that, that I do know that that group of, of yes, people. Yes, I'm Gen X. I wish I were Gen Z, <laughs> but that was a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Stephanie Stoll-Dalgen, your host for the State of the State of Hawaii, and we've been uh, it's been a pleasure to have Dr. Colin Moore, who directs the U UH Manoa de, um, Policy Center, and uh, we've been talking about the impact of the state's midterm election recently. So thank you for viewing, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.